crackdown on extremists. The Catholic Church in Sri Lanka sends a strong message to the government in the aftermath of Easter suicide bombings. Synagogue shooting. One person is killed, three others injured during a rampage at Congregation Shabbat of Poway in California. Now the White House is responding. Annual report. A bipartisan watchdog group highlights the most egregious violators of religious freedom. We're on Capitol Hill. And a helping hand, how Pope Francis is reaching out to migrants in Mexico. On EWTN News Nightly for Monday, April 29th, 2019. Good evening from Washington, D.C., and thank you to those of you joining us from around the world for news from a Catholic perspective. I'm Lauren Ashburn. Security officials in Sri Lanka say Islamic extremists are planning more attacks. The Catholic Church is fighting back against Easter church bombings, urging the government to increase its crackdown as if on war footing. <laughs> Cardinal Malcolm Ranjith is the Archbishop of Colombo and said he is not satisfied with how the government has conducted its investigation so far. Churches across the island nation remain closed for fear of more attacks. ISIS has claimed responsibility for those Easter attacks, which killed more than 250 people and injured more than 500. Differences are good. Differences are beautiful. Cardinal Ranjit celebrated Sunday Mass in a small chapel at his residence. Catholics in Sri Lanka watched in their homes via a televised broadcast. Sri Lanka is a majority Buddhist country but has significant Hindu and Muslim populations. Seven percent are Christian, most of those are Catholic. As a Southern California community is saying goodbye to the victim of a shooting Saturday at a synagogue, the FBI says it received a tip just five minutes ahead of the attack but it was too late to identify the suspect. It happened on the last day of Passover, one of Judaism's holiest days of the year. We believe in God, we believe God is good, and if God picked Lori Kay, if God picked Lori Kay, then he did this for a reason, and the reason is good, because we believe God is good. Police say a 19-year-old man opened fire at Shabbat of Poway in Southern California Saturday as 100 people were worshiping. The attack killed this woman, Lori Kay, and injured three others, including Rabbi Yeshol Goldstein. It happened before the gun jammed. The suspect in the attack is being held without bail. The shooting happened on the six-month anniversary of a mass shooting at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh. President Trump says the evil of anti-Semitism must be defeated. He sent condolences to the synagogue's rabbi over the weekend, and today the White House says the president will use the bully pulpit to call out hate. But some lawmakers say the president is part of the problem. White House correspondent Mark Irons reports. Good evening, Mark. Good evening, Lauren. This latest violence in California was an attack on Jews, but a week ago it was Christians in Sri Lanka, and before that, Muslims in New Zealand. The question tonight, what can the White House do to keep houses of worship safe? Following the synagogue attack in California, the president pledged the nation will stand in solidarity with the Jewish community. We forcefully condemn the evil of anti-Semitism and hate, which must be defeated. The unthinkable, the unfathomable where I faced death face to face. Rabbi Saral Goldstein, injured in the shooting, says he was comforted by a call President Trump made to him on Sunday. The president adding on Twitter, I extended my warmest condolences to him and all affected by the shooting in California. What a great guy. He had at least one finger blown off and all he wanted to do is help others. Very special. The synagogue outside San Diego, the latest target in a string of deadly attacks inside houses of worship across the globe. Muslims, Christians, and Jews among the casualties. U.S. Catholic bishops condemning the hatred, stating it has no place in faith, writing, it is a contradiction, a perverting of their teachings to believe that Christianity, Judaism, or Islam would condone such violence. Unfortunately, both in the past and today, too many preach such hatred in the name of God. This cannot be abided. It must end. Today, the White House said hatred will not be tolerated under President Trump.
I think uh, one of the most important things we can do is use the uh, bully pulpit of the president and call out this hatred by name. But some lawmakers are questioning just how well the president is doing that. Why do these people feel they have license now to attack synagogues, to attack sick temples, to attack churches across the United States? This has really been fomented because of the rhetoric that we're hearing from the White House. The president has faced ongoing criticism since 2017 for comments he made defending some people at a white nationalist rally in Charlottesville, Virginia. And the president's political opponents won't forget it. Former Vice President Joe Biden made President Trump's response to Charlottesville a key focus of his own presidential campaign launch video. Lauren. And is getting attacked by the president for it. White House correspondent Mark Irons, thank you, Mark. Religious oppression around the world is on the rise. That's according to a new report released today by an independent bipartisan commission. Their findings show an enormous increase in repression of people of faith, including Christians. Correspondent Wyatt Goolsby joins us from Capitol Hill, where the commission unveiled the report this morning. Good evening, Wyatt. Good evening, Lauren. Think about it this way. The vast majority of the world, more than 75%, live in countries where there is some form of religious oppression, and it's not getting any better. So today, the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, also called USERF, called out some of the worst violators of religious freedom. One country commissioners say is in a category all by itself, China. Religious freedom advocates vow not to forget the plight of minority groups, like Uyghur Muslims, forced into, quote, re-education camps by the Chinese government. And the situation is getting worse. Commissioners with USERF spoke about some of the biggest religious freedom issues while meeting on Capitol Hill. Our Lauren Ashburn moderated the discussion and posed questions about China and the Easter Sunday bombings in Sri Lanka. Where we saw a glaring need was houses of worship as they have now become targets of terrorists. The commission recommends the State Department add five terrorist organizations as entities of particular concern. ISIS, the Taliban in Afghanistan, al-Shabaab in Somalia, the Houthis in Yemen, and Hayat Tahrir al-Sham in Syria. In addition, they recommend the State Department add six more countries to their list of countries of particular concern. The Central African Republic, Nigeria, Russia, Syria, Uzbekistan, and Vietnam. Christina Ariaga, the vice chair of USERF, tells me Christians are often targeted by both terrorists and governments. Many religious groups believe that we're born with human dignity, and that becomes a type of idea that is threatening to governments that want to regulate everything that an individual does. One potential solution? An online victims database that is launching soon. It will allow users to read about individuals who have gone to prison for practicing their faith. On many occasions, we've gotten them out. We've gotten three out in the last eight months. But secondly, it has the effect of educating the world on an issue they otherwise didn't, didn't know about. USERF is also making recommendations to the Trump administration, like appointing a special advisor to the president on international religious freedom within the National Security Council staff. In addition, they've also recommended sanctions, using sanctions against individuals and agencies, including denying them visas. Lauren? Correspondent Wyatt Goolsby reporting today from Capitol Hill. Thank you, Wyatt. The U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo says the Obama administration should have done more to stop Russian interference in the 2016 presidential election. Yeah, sure. Uh, of course, uh, the Russians interfered. It happened in uh, the run-up to the election in 2016. Of course, uh, they should have done everything they could to prevent it. I, I don't want to go back and revisit and critique. We have the we have the mission now to make sure this doesn't happen in 2020. I mentioned before, Pompeo uh, spoke I, this morning to the Hill's editor in chief and frequent News Nightly guest Bob Cusack. The secretary says Russian interference isn't new and should be expected for decades to come. Presidential candidate Joe Biden picks his native state for his first campaign speech. Today, the road to the White House runs through Pennsylvania. Donald Trump was the first Republican nominee to win it since 1988, with more than 550 days until Election Day. Former Vice President Joe Biden can he win over blue-collar voters? Capitol Hill correspondent Jason Calvi joins us. It was a black-and-gold rally there for Mr. Biden. Good evening, Jason. 
Good evening, Lauren. Pennsylvania is key for Democrats' hopes to retake the White House. Harry S. Truman, back in 1948, the last Democrat to lose the state but go on to win the White House. Now, President Trump is focusing on another key battleground state, Wisconsin. He won it in 2016. He rallied there again on Saturday, and he's again bringing up the issue of life. The commander-in-chief takes aim at infanticide. The baby is born. The mother meets with the doctor. They take care of the baby. They wrap the baby beautifully. And then the doctor and the mother determine whether or not they will execute the baby. I don't think so. Presidential hopeful Cory Booker calls that a lie. President Trump counters Virginia's governor from January. Um, the infant would be delivered. Uh, the infant would be kept comfortable. Uh, the infant would be resuscitated if, if that's what the uh, mother and the family desired. And then a discussion would ensue between the physicians and the mother. Joe Biden once criticized Roe v. Wade. In 1974, he told the Washingtonian magazine, I don't like the Supreme Court decision on abortion. I think it went too far. I don't think that a woman has the sole right to say what should happen to her body. He did vote in 1995 and 2003 to ban partial birth abortion. But National Right to Life says Biden never voted with them again. In a 2007 debate, he said he strongly supports Roe v. Wade. And on the 2012 VP debate stage, Joe Biden faced Paul Ryan. Life begins at conception. That's the church's judgment. I accept it in my personal life. But I refuse to impose it on equally devout Christians and Muslims and Jews. And uh, I just refuse to impose that on others. I don't see how a person can separate their public life from their private life or from their faith. President Trump brought up infanticide in Green Bay. Wisconsin's Democratic governor, Tony Evers, vows to veto the Born Alive Abortion Survivors Protection Act. Evers says babies are already protected. Now, supporters of the bill argue it is needed. It would force doctors to treat babies who survive an attempted abortion. Lauren? Capitol Hill correspondent Jason Calvi. Thank you, Jason. The leader of ISIS appears in a video for the first time in five years. Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi acknowledged the group's defeat in Syria but vows a long battle ahead. In the video, he discussed the Easter bombings in Sri Lanka. With a $25 million bounty on his head, al-Baghdadi is the world's most wanted man. Despite numerous claims about his death in recent years, his whereabouts remain a mystery. The Greek Orthodox community around the world celebrated Easter yesterday. In Jerusalem, a large crowd marked the resurrection of Jesus. The Greek Orthodox patriarch led a colorful procession through the streets. In Russia, President Vladimir Putin attended midnight mass at Moscow's Christ the Savior Cathedral. The date of Greek Orthodox Easter traditionally differs from Western Christianity as it is based on a different calendar. Pope Francis appeals for the evacuation of women, children, and sick migrants trapped in Libya. Yesterday, the Holy Father asked the faithful to join him in praying for the refugees who are being held in detention centers and are trapped between warring factions. The Pope has previously referred to the condition of migrants in Libyan detention centers, particularly those who are sent back after trying to reach Europe by boat. And Pope Francis has donated $500,000 to help migrants in Mexico. In a statement, the Vatican said media coverage of this emergency has been decreasing, and as a result, aid to migrants by the government and private individuals has also decreased. Our Rome Bureau Chief, Alan Holdren, has more from Rome. Lauren, this money will go to local projects that provide food, lodging, and basic necessities. The funds come from the Peter's Pence Collections. That's financial support offered by the faithful to the Holy Father to donate as he sees fit. The donations will be distributed among 27 different projects promoted by 16 Mexican dioceses and religious congregations. Pope Francis has defended migrants from the beginning of his pontificate, and he's asked governments to balance justice with mercy. So this donation is a clear sign that migrants continue to be a priority for him. According to a Vatican statement, migrants are men, women, and often young children who are fleeing poverty and violence and hoping for a better future in the United States. Just recently on Good Friday, the Holy Father said migrants find closed doors because of fear and hearts hardened by, quote, political calculations. 
In the past, the Holy Father has donated to other causes. Earlier this month, he gave a little more than $100,000 to victims of flooding in Iran. And in March, he donated money to Mozambique, Zimbabwe, and Malawi, also impacted by flooding after a cyclone. In Rome, Alan Holdren, EWTN News Nightly. Coming up, a new home for a Catholic immigration center along the U.S.-Mexico border. At a U.N. Security Council meeting in New York, the Holy See implored U.N. member nations to focus on peace when it comes to Israeli-Palestinian conflicts in the Middle East. More than 50 nations are concerned about this ongoing conflict in the Holy Land, and many are giving their support for the plight of Palestinians. Concerns were raised about Jewish settlers who have moved into the West Bank, an area which, since 1979, the U.N. has recognized as belonging to the Palestinians. These settlements are seen as a huge obstacle for peace and are considered illegal under international law. There are now nearly 450,000 Jewish settlers in the West Bank. And we welcome Sabrina Farisi, our U.N. correspondent, to the broadcast. She joins us from the U.N. Welcome, Sabrina. Tell us what the Holy See mission said about these matters of settlers in Jerusalem. Monsignor Griza, the deputy of the Holy See Mission, spoke about the bleak situation in Palestinian areas. He said that many people have paid the price of violence, that dialogue must continue. But what was very interesting is that he said the increasingly fragmented Palestinian land will, with the passing of time, only make the two-state solution more difficult to realize. This was a direct reference to settlers in the West Bank, an area which, as you know, was supposed to be set aside for Palestinians. The Vatican backs a two-state solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and anything that jeopardizes that is problematic. So how did both Israel and Palestine respond to this? When the Israeli and, and, when the Israeli and Palestinian ambassador spoke about the settler situation, they had completely different perspectives. The Israeli ambassador defended his people's right to the land. He said it was found in the Bible. He also said that their right to the West Bank came from history, that King David and King Solomon lived there, their first two temples were there. He called the West Bank area Judea. Now, the Palestinian ambassador was appalled. He said <laughs> that the settlers were a complete disregard for Palestinian rights. He said they were a violation of international law. And he said that the U.N. is constantly calling for an end to the settlements and that these words need to be followed by action. Well, then he must not have been very pleased about how member nations viewed U.S. support for Israel. How did that play out? Well, most U.N. member nations disagree with unquestioned support, the U.S. support for Israel. This support seems to have emboldened Israel to build more settlements. In fact, Prime Minister Netanyahu said one week before his April 9th election that he would annex the settlements to the state of Israel. Now, most member nations are very supportive and sympathetic of the plight of the Palestinian people. They want a two-state solution, and they want peace. Sabrina Farisi reporting from the United Nations in New York City. Thank you, Sabrina. Thank you, Lauren. McAllen, Texas officials approve a new downtown location for a Catholic Immigration Relief Center. The Respite Center of Catholic Charities of the Rio Grande Valley was ordered by the city in February to leave this location in a residential neighborhood. Neighbors had complained about the constant traffic and strangers wandering the streets. Overseen by Sister Norma Pimentel, this respite center has helped an estimated 150,000 migrants since 2014. Up next, a satanic group says it has been given IRS status as a church. We have analysis. And the Pope's message for hairstylists. The satanic temple says it has received tax-exempt designation as a church by the IRS. In a statement on its website, the group writes, this acknowledgement will help make sure the Satanic Temple has the same access to public spaces as other religious organizations, affirm our standing in court when battling religious discrimination, 
and enable us to apply for faith-based government grants. Joining me now is Robert Warren, Research Associate at the Bush School of Business at the Catholic University of America and a retired IRS criminal investigator. Robert, we couldn't think of the more perfect person well, thank to be you. talking to us about this. So, is the Satanic Temple a church? The IRS hasn't confirmed it, uh, but in your opinion, was this the right call? No, it was not the right call for several reasons. First, if you go to the website for the Satanic Temple... Which I don't... Uh, I, I mean, you go there with your eyes wide open. Absolutely. Yeah. It says right there that they are a non-theistic organization, that they're atheists, and they don't promote a, a belief in Satan itself. So why call it the Satanic Temple? Well, they get plenty of benefits from it. If you're a, if you're a church, you get what's called financial anonymity from the IRS and the public. So now the Satanic Temple can raise money, spend money, and accrue assets without having to report it to the government on what's called a Form 990. This could be very troubling to the faithful who could be concerned that this implies that Satanic ministers mm -hmm. hold the same weight as those of more traditional faiths. Your thought? Oh, well, they're absolutely right. And for example, let's say a, a minister from the Satanic Temple wants to say a prayer in front of Congress at the beginning of the day. At the House there, of Representatives? Sure. Exactly. There's no reason to say they can't do it now. What about if one of their ministers, quote unquote, wants to be a chaplain in the military and receive military pay and government benefits? It's hard to say they can't. Are we going to allow these ministers to say prayers with troops before they go into battle? It's hard to say they can't or won't. Well, why would they say a prayer if they're atheist? Well, that, that's <laughs> this it. Is the, that's the this is the crux of this problem. Exactly. And so I just don't understand how they can be a church. But given your decades of work there, Robert Warren, there's a clear distinction between churches and mm -hmm. other religious organizations. Tell me some of the characteristics that help define a church for the IRS. Sure. What you have to remember is that in the voluminous tax code, there is no definition of what a church is. Instead, the IRS re, um, tries to rely on 14 different criteria, which comes through administrative guidance and court decisions. For example, do you have ordained ministers? Do you hold regular worship services? Do you have scriptures? Do you have dogma? Do you have Sunday school? These things of that nature, none of, none of which the Satanic Temple does. Okay. I'm still baffled. We're, we're going to keep going here. Sure. Um, I want to look at some of the numbers of the applications uh, receiving IRS approval for, for tax exempt status in 2017. There were more than 85,000 total applications by religious, charitable, and similar organizations. More than 79,000 of those were approved. Thousands were placed in this other category, and only 42 were disapproved. Is, if you are one of those 42, or even if you're just you or me, and you don't like who was approved, mm -hmm. can you do anything to change it? Who can change what the IRS says? I know there are two things true in life, death and taxes, yeah. so I'm not very convinced that we're going to be able to change them. Sure. The first thing you have to remember is every tax-exempt organization, including churches who want tax-exempt status, files a Form 1023 uh, with the IRS, and those are public documents. And then the IRS will send what's called a determination letter to the groups, which is also a public document. So if the faithful was so inclined, they can write the IRS to get those documents. Meaning I can say, Absolutely. dear IRS, give me their 1023. Exactly. And you can review it for yourself, the 1023 and the determination letter. And if you think it was wrongly decided, you can write the Commissioner of Internal Revenue, who, by the way, used to serve on the Board of Directors of a Carmelite High School, and ask them to reconsider. With the IRS giveth, the IRS can take can it take away. Take it away. Oh, wow. Well, you know that as an IRS investigator, yeah. I'm sure. Robert Warren, thank you so much for your analysis. Thank you. Research Associate at the Bush School of Business at the Catholic University of America. Finally tonight, Pope Francis offers some career advice to hairdressers. Ad esercitare la vostra professione con stile cristiano. The Holy Father encouraged a group of 230 Italian hairstylists to practice their profession in a Christian style. He told them to treat their clients politely and to avoid gossip. I would add there to listen to your clients when they say don't take two inches off. Only take a half an inch. Got it? Okay. We're on the same page here. For all of us here at EWTN News Nightly, to all of you around the world, thank you for watching. I'm Lauren Ashburn. Let's keep in touch online. Follow me at Lauren Ashburn on Twitter and Lauren Ashburn EWTN on Facebook. Good night and God bless you.